Today's episode of Asset Horizon is a very special one. Today we have Catherine Malibu. For some of our listeners, she needs no introduction. And for others, well, you're in for a big treat right now. Today's topic is metaphysical anarchy and political anarchy and their juncture. Together with Catherine, we will be looking at the work of Reiner Sherman, who has been credited as one of the few philosophers of metaphysical anarchy. Together with Catherine, we will be pushing this text to the limit. This is also a good time to remind you to subscribe to Asset Horizon wherever you listen and think about subscribing to our Patreon. We have some extras on our site, including a regular reading group, which we run. Not only do the funds help support the podcast, but we take a sizable portion of that and donate it to mutual aid funds. Okay, let's get to the episode. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. It's Craig, Will, Matt, and Adam here. And today we are privileged to be joined by Catherine Malibu, professor of philosophy at the European Graduate School, as well as the Center for Research in Modern European Philosophy, where she also supervises our very own anarcho-Hegelian, Adam. Her research spans a vast and widely celebrated collection of works developing in and around her central concept of plasticity, and throughout numerous developments and interventions into fields such as Hegelianism, deconstruction, Kantianism, the philosophies of epigenesis and neurobiology, feminism, and artificial intelligence, to name but a few. Today, Catherine joins us to discuss the metaphysics of anarchy, the most plastic of social forms, and its political implications, particularly in the light of her coming work on anarchism, plasticity, and pleasure. To do so, we'll be using the introductory chapter from Reiner Sherman's Heidegger on Being and Acting, From Principles to Anarchy, as our source text for the discussion. Catherine, thank you again. Well, thank you for having me. So the text that we have in focus today is Reiner Sherman's analysis of, of Heidegger's work, which is, on his terms, a backwards reading of Heidegger in order to articulate this concept of anarchy. Catherine, maybe you can actually start us off. What is the concept of anarchy that, that you are attempting to develop based on the, the work that we are looking at today? Well, I, I, was, I was struck by the fact that some uh, of the most uh, prominent uh, continental philosophers from the second half of the 20th century, some of them had a strong concept of anarchy. So among these philosophers, I can quote, so Sherman, of course, this is explicit in the title, but also Levinas, Derrida, Foucault, uh, Agamben, Rancière, and Deleuze. And uh, no one has ever systematically studied both metaphysical and political value of this concept. So I decided to do so. And I noticed that in most cases, anarchism or anarchy in these philosophers was more treated as a philosophical concept than a political one. And that there was a kind of dissociation between anarchy uh, and anarchism. So Schumann is uh, certainly the one who explains most in detail, I mean, is, is the most explicit about what metaphysical anarchism can be. So that's why I decided that for tonight's show, we should focus on this text. I think he's the first, he's the first to propose a metaphysical concept. Now, one of the concepts that he's using in order to articulate this theory of anarchy is the notion of deconstruction, mm -hmm. which based on just reading the introduction of the text seems to me to be an attack on the dogmatic image of thought in the manner of Kant. But how does the operation of deconstruction either approach or fail to become the notion of anarchy that Sherman is edging on? Well, uh, it's rather than deconstruction, is leading to uh, this metaphysical anarchism he's talking about. Um, so we have to go back to the very etymology of the term anarchy, anarchia in Greek, which means literally without an archi, and archi it means in Greek principle. And principle has two senses, two meanings, a uh, beginning, mm, uh, we can hear primary in principle, so something that begins, and at the same time, something that commands. 
And Aristotle, well, the, the term archi existed in Greek before Aristotle, but he was the first to transform this word into a concept because he, he un, unified, united the two meanings, like a beginning and commandment. So a principle is what determines everything, ontological, political, practical, etc. Metaphysics, a classical metaphysics, uh, lays foundation on the idea that, that there is no disorder or chaos into the cosmos or the, well, let's say, uh, the ontological arrangement of the world. That everything derives from, I think this is an important idea, to derive from, this is what Schumann calls the pros hen schema in Greek, which means that everything must come from something else. Uh, and this order of derivation is the order of metaphysics itself. In fact, metaphysics, uh, the task of metaphysics is to study the order of things. That is the way in which everything derives from something else that is namely a cause. Deconstruction is precisely in the literal meaning, the act of undoing this order, this causal order, uh, by uh, stating that after all, perhaps everything comes from nothing. Perhaps anarchy means that, in fact, things that are what they are contingently, uh, and it doesn't mean chaos, or even if Nietzsche talks about chaos, it doesn't mean that everything is a big disorder, but that sometimes the systematicity of the causal order is absent. It's interesting because Sherman, early on in the introduction, talks about, he brings up the names Proudhon and yes. Bakunin and says that their notion of anarchy is not the notion of anarchy that he's trying to develop. In fact, what they're trying to do is more or less reorder the coordinates of power. Would you think that political anarchism, uh, and maybe this is jumping a little too far ahead, could benefit from the intimation of the idea of metaphysical anarchy that, that Sherman's going for here? First of all, I would like to say that this critique of anarchism, like uh, it's just a replacement of a principle uh, by another. This is a very classical critique of anarchism, like, oh, anarchists think they are free from uh, principles, that is from the derivative order, but in fact, they reinstitute a new form of principle. So anarchism is in fact an archism, not an anarchism. So instead of having God or uh, substance or cause, they have human nature, they have equality, they have principles, just like other uh, philosophers or theoreticians. So I don't like this critique at all. I think that Sherman, when he says things like that, like, uh, I'm not talking about anarchism in the sense of Proudhon, is very backward. My guess is that, nevertheless, if we read Sherman uh, in a certain way, uh, yes, we, we can perhaps find something interesting in his critique. And as you said, Proudhon's and classical anarchism may benefit from it. But it has to be really uh, uh, dug out for, you know, like mining. You have to go uh, for the gold nugget that is hidden into a... I like that. <laughs> yeah, yes. I've been thinking about this idea of the metaphysics of, of an anarchy as in to be without command, and particularly regarding the notions that Sherman is working uh, through, through here in terms of Heidegger, and in terms of metaphysics as the idea that we must move from theory to praxis, to do theory... Yes. To to do to move from the principles to the command of the action itself, and I'm wondering what how the notion of metaf the metaphysics, uh, you know, the process of metaphysics itself being uh, closed, becoming closed, becoming finalized, how that can undo the very structure of this uh, theory and practice relation itself, because in a sense, once you you've closed off the entire system in Heidegger, so in with other thinkers like Hegel, there's this question of a radical openness, a, a what then? And I think this, this metaphor of digging is quite good because now that all of these formal elaborations have uh, elaborated themselves and have left themselves open, have completed themselves, they become much more adaptable to a more creative form of, of redeployment without the command of the original logics, the original ignorance that propelled their original development. I'm just wondering how this metaphysical closure relates to 
the process of a new openness to a kind of almost like a post metaphysics beyond the command of of the arche and of the first principles of presuppositions in in general, really. Well, so yes, this is of course very important, but Schumann, in fact, analyzes a double process. And archism is not only a new opening to something new. It is, of course, but it is also the result of the self-deconstruction of metaphysics. I think it is important to, to affirm that deconstruction is not a voluntary gesture that Heidegger and Derrida would have inaugurated. It is a process of self-destruction of metaphysics. For Schumann, clearly the principles are exhausted today. So this is the, the motive of nihilism that Nietzsche had already analyzed, uh, which is that, in fact, principles get exhausted out of their own power. Huh? Because, they, in fact, the problem of the principle is that it can never find its right place. It is either too high above what it is the principle of, or it is part of what it is the principle of, and then it ceases to be a principle. So the principle is always too high or too low. It has never found its place. And so this is this process of internal process of exhaustion of the principle that leads to anarchism. So it's, if something new can happen, and uh, you're right, it is a new vision of acting, it is a new vision of uh, political commitment, huh? it will, of course, be a creation, but a creation that uh, relies on an exhaustion. So that's a very, very strange. Um, if you want, it's not a revolution. And I think this is the, the break with Proudhon and, and all anarchists. Huh? Uh, it, it won't happen like a revolution. It will happen as a negotiation between the old and the new. You see what I mean? Yeah. And I think that maps on to the very generational conflicts, politics of today, at least. Catherine, thank you for um, coming on and taking the time to talk to us today. There was something you mentioned earlier when you were giving an explanation of the sort of this problem of uh, first principles that Sherman um, explores in this book and in this, and in this chapter we've been reading. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this is a really quite short question in a way, which is that I, I've been recently reading um, Louis Althusser's Philosophy Encounter. And mm -hmm. in, in that book, of course, in Underground Currents of Materialism of the Encounter, yes. he's, of course, trying to trace out this sort of buried history of a materialism, which is a sort of almost in principle disorder, but it starts from disorder rather than order. Um, and I was wondering if you think there's any relation between what perhaps Althusser is trying to do there, what we're reading in Sherman and perhaps in your own work. Yeah, yes, thank you very much. Yes, of course, I see, I see the, the, the common points, you're right. And the uh, reference to Epicurus and the uh, atoms yeah. and, uh, uh, yes, of course, and this contingency. Uh, that Althusser is talking about is, of course, it resonates clearly with what Sherman is thinking then. But would any Marxist uh, recognize that there's something anarchist in Althusser? I, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, Sherman would say that materialism is still a metaphysical uh, notion. You know, it is still a systematic way of, of seeing things. Even if I agree with you, there are some common points, definitely coming from nothing. I remember that. Yeah. That the prince comes from somewhere, uh, comes from nothing. So yes, that there is a strong um, resemblance. And at the same time, uh, I think there's a mm. limit. Huh? Insofar as it's mm. still, it still remains a kind of systematic and metaphysical understanding but, of the world. It's precisely what Sherman thinks is, is sort of already, almost yes, already dead, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Catherine, last night I was mulling over this notion of the avowal of ignorance, which I thought was one of the most beautiful parts of this piece. Mm, mm. And I actually had a dream very early this morning that that resonates closely <laughs> with with what's happening in this text. I was forced in the dream, I was forced to explain to an old man, an indolent old man, some very important philosophical concept, which it doesn't matter what the content of it was, and I just couldn't do it. I tried high, going high, going low, using sophisticated terms, using not so sophisticated terms. And then in the end, uh, for my effort, he reported me to the authorities. And it made me think that at the basis of my attempt to explain, and, and one of the first things I thought of when I woke up was this concept of the avowal of ignorance. And it made me think that beneath 
our attempt to conceptualize foundations, to assert any sort of firmness of of a concept lies this this notion of ignorance you know there's so many metaphors that we can use mm-hmm. the peeling back of an onion till nothing is there you know do we think about ignorance as a kind of a, an infusion of a non-thought or a non-knowledge in our knowledge you know i do work on deleuze mm-hmm. and and clearly what's at stake here is the idea of thinking the concept of thinking what is a thought and it seems that sherman in his reading of heidegger is saying that there is this 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 idea of an ignorance or, or uh, you know, maybe a nothingness or a stupidity at the center of all thinking. But I tend to think that maybe that term is a bit loaded with the notion of a lack or a, a negative, whereas in Deleuzean terms, the act of creating concepts is, is itself one that is is positive. How are we to think of this notion of ignorance? Yes, th- this is uh, this is very interesting. Um, the uh, ignorance uh, Sherman is talking about is uh, about Heidegger. Uh, when, uh, when Heidegger was asked, so uh, what is it to be done now? What can we do? Uh, how do you see the future of uh, anything? I don't know. And Heidegger used to answer, it's true, I don't know. And it means that if, as Adam was saying, something like an opening is coming, that is a, a liberation of praxis, of acting from theory, that is from principles, then uh, it is clear that nobody can really anticipate what will happen. And I, I myself, I'm very annoyed at all these books, you know, um, that come out come, uh, come out at the moment, you know, about the pandemics. Now this is what will happen. Now this is, you know, like people uh, who think they can predict and they can tell what will happen? So ignorance is in that sense; it is not at all negative, which of course does not uh, contradict what you said. That is that thinking is creative, thinking is productive, uh, thinking is an invention. But I think there's a strong difference and perhaps an incompatibility between creation and prediction. Of course, Marxist here might uh, argue that. This is a, a regressive way of seeing history because history is a causal process. And e- even if we c- cannot predict what is coming, we can at least study causes and, and, and see how certain causes would uh, produce the same effects, etc. So perhaps they would see that as a regressive way of thinking. But I don't think so. Just to map this onto the, uh, the yeah, certain Marxists, well, particularly Leninist visions of the withering away of the state, yeah, the Marxist system is itself, uh, if you can call it a system, I mean, I call it a system, is itself a move from these principles of political economy to its own self-destruction, to its own deconstruction, its own, its own withering away. And I can see, yeah, you have a tension in, uh, especially to Marxism and what Sherman, Sherman is trying to do in terms of how, you know, for, for Sherman, this has already happened in a sense. Thinking has already endured its own closure, only construction. It's it's ahead of Marxism. It's ahead of the political economy, and I think that's it's a position that is you know, has a place of radical contingency. And and as as you said before, Catherine, you know it, it it's a risky position. There's that sense of risk, isn't it? You know, what is to be done? And if you can't be commanded, if you can't be conser- you know inserted into the new proletarian ideology, as, as some readings of Althusser put it, there is that sense of, of, of risk, but there's also that sense of, of, of liberation, of the, of the immediacy of to act, but at the same time there's no ultimate fixity with which uh, acting is to be predisposed. I mean, Sherman summarizes up really well. You know, he says that for radical phenomenology, Western man has, has incurred his tutelage by endowing some of his representations with ultimacy. Release from such self-incurred tutelage can only come from reasons undoing what it has itself set up. And even in the post-systematic sense, this can mean, uh, I mean, for me, a, a great source of playfulness, such as I see in, in your reading of Hegel, where the idea of after the system has developed through its own uh, impulse to become itself, this energy becomes sort of released in its own completion. Things become malleable, the new uh, Form, the forms that were previously endowed with a certain determination become indeterminate because there's a sense of, of what now. And I think maybe this is just something that's you know, incompatible with the Marxists, but something that you could still definitely learn from in terms of the distinction between theory and praxis collapsing because they're obviously a very theoretically uh, endowed crowd. Well, if you take 
someone like Rancière, uh, he's very close to what you're describing. You know that Rancière distinguishes between politics and police. Police is politics in the usual sense of the term, that is government, etc., etc. And politics is the anarchist, it is all kind of um, unexpected, anarchistic kind of uh, event, you know, uh, like assemblies, like uh, Occupy Movement, etc. And Rancière says uh, there, there are very few moments when something like politics can happen. Um, most of the time we are with the police, in the police. Uh, and the po well, politics, the political, uh, really, that is the anarchist, anarchism for him, can only, um, it's not perhaps always playful, as you said, but it is always creative, always unexpected, always, um, yes, always an invention. And it, it cannot, as you say, it cannot be transformed into into any kind of fixity. Once he has one of my interests as well, okay, because I, I I'm working on the idea of radical democracy, and that's democracy, of course, is quite an important element of Rancière's thought. And this is frankly more of a more of a comment than a question, but um, you're right. But I, I I sort of I, I agree with you. I, I noticed in in Rancière's thought, it, it's that he comes so close to wanting to say something like anarchism. And then it's almost as if at the very last moment, he just distances himself a little bit from it. And, and you know, this is for me the big, the big problem that why do they, at the last moment, exactly, exactly what you said, at the very last moment, why don't they say, okay, I am an anarchist? No. At the very last moment, they say, oh, no, 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 no. I have a very strong concept of anarchy, but I'm not an anarchist. Yeah. That's strange. I mean, if you take Balibar, Althusser, nobody would ever hesitate to say, I'm a Marxist. So what what is the problem with anarchy? And he does he does he does the same sort of thing when he talks about democracy a lot of the time in that and, and polit politics and police in general. I mean, politics, of course, as you said, he he will, he will grant it a certain place within our our lives, but it's always a kind of restrictive and and very limited one. It, it's something that happens every now and then, and perhaps once or twice in our lives we experience something like yes. that. But not it's not something that can be lived out in a, in a more meaningful and lasting way. I, just, I uh, That's my reading anyway, Vance, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And so um, the problem, because what, what I find fascinating in Rancière is, is his, uh, his critique of uh, the, the concept of government, when he says uh, all government is an oligarchy. And I think this is uh, very true. And in fact, you have a coincidence between what uh, Sherman will call a principle and what Rancière or Foucault will call government. In fact, it has the same meaning, both commandment and beginning. And so you have this very radical critique of governmentality, of government on the basis of radical equality. And as you said, at the same time, this non-governmentality, this radical equality can only emerge at very rare moments and perhaps won't ever appear. This is strange. I, I think too, if if it's okay, that there there seems to be this notion of uh, like in the work of of Deleuze, Deleuze's description of Foucault, mm -hmm. um, and then even like the way that like Klesowski and Deleuze will describe Nietzsche, and the way even in some ways Sherman uh, briefly describes Nietzsche in here mm -hmm, is that mm -hmm. the the anarchism at the level of either like political ontology or with Nietzsche metaphysics is, or with Deleuze and difference and repetition, the, the anarchism is coupled with like a fundamental risk. So like for, for Deleuze, it is an attempt to sort of think difference without falling back on representation mm -hmm. or to try to find a way to propose thought without an image. Right. Right. Uh, yes, this is very true. I just wonder, you know, in, the, the punitive society, we get this articulation from Foucault where he says that there is a rigorousness to the, to the anarchist ideology, uh, he'll say. But then he won't 
move forward mm-hmm. uh, and and provide any sort he'll just say there's there's a unique rigorousness to anarchism or and then Deleuze will say well you know the the way in which he deals with Nietzsche is is to propose a sort of crowned anarchy mm-hmm. in metaphysics um so i wonder uh if this shows a sort of because for Foucault in at the end of Madison Civilization he talks about whether or not uh you know the painting Goya's idiot is the last convulsion of the last dying man or rather is this sort of radical break uh uh that we find in Nietzsche the sort of like rejective madness this sort of opening up of an anarchist uh an anarchist possibility of like uh, a world free of that which mutilates man in life and so on. Um, so I, I wonder if you, you have any comment on on why it's always linked to – anarchism is always linked to sort of a gambit. There's always a dice throw for some reason that mitigates any sort of commitment that you could get. If you try to um, radicalize the – let's say the anarchist idea. In, in, let's admit there's only one. Uh, what is it? It is – uh, we can live without a government. We don't need to be governmentalized, which means that the uh, partition between obeying and commanding collapses. So either this is a very childish idea, and many people have said this is really too naive. Of course, we all need to be governed. Otherwise, look at that. Societies would collapse, etc. So either you reject it by saying this is really ridiculous or you discover that it is a very deep question that the problematic of how commandment and obedience are linked together, how they became linked. Huh? And Aristotle is one of the most uh, powerful um, thinker of this linkage. Then it becomes abysmal. And of course it is risky because Nobody ever had really an answer to that. So you will say, of course, the classical anarchists had answers like the commune, like uh, platforms, uh, federalism, of course, but it has not really been convincing because it has been uh, repressed so harshly that we didn't really have time to... Uh, judge whether these forms were viable or not. So, of course, it is very risky. But, you know, my problem is that in thinkers like Deleuze, Foucault, etc., let's take Deleuze, let's limit ourselves to Deleuze. On the one hand, there's this risky part, and you're totally right. But on the other, he's someone who declares that being is anarchic. And even anarchist, if you if you remember this text on Plotinus, it says Plotinus is the first anarchist. And Sherman agrees on that point. Because uh, in, in Plotinus, the principle is not really a principle. You know, it's negative theology. So it's a principle without a principle. And so all beings are perfectly equal. And Deleuze, several times, talks about this anarchistic ontological arrangement in which no being has any supremacy on any other. So how do you explain the gap between saying, oh, politically speaking, anarchism is risky, but ontologically it is okay? Because when you declare that being is anarchic, when you declare a kind of ontological anarchy, it is extremely risky. And here we can think of Nietzsche, of course. It is monstrous. So why do they admit, Deleuze and Foucault and other? why do they admit almost calmly, quietly, that something like an ontological anarchy exists? And why do they freak out when it comes to political anarchism. You know, this is something I don't understand, really. Yes, as soon as you say subjects are radically equal, beings are radically equal, there are no principles, uh, there are no causes, uh, there's only imminence. There's a kind of imminent movement of equality. It is very risky. I love the way that you you describe your frustration because I think it's it's so 
fundamental to the, it, because it isn't as though anarchic movements in sort of political developments in Europe, even in Japan and mm-hmm. the United States weren't moved by these these works by these authors. But there was always this sort of sidestep. Yeah, exactly. That's par- paradoxical because these people, Deleuze and others, are considered post-anarchists, even if they ne- never declared themselves anarchists. One of the ways that what we're talking about now ties into what we've been discussing on the podcast recently is um, we, we've been covering the concept of destituent power and the, the recent book by Marcelo Tari. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it seems pretty clear to me that there's a strong analogy between the metaphysical anarchy that we're talking about here and this notion of destituent power. And maybe one of the, the risks, at least in terms of how we covered it in our most recent episode was Tari, at least in the introduction of the book, seems hesitant to um, speak of democracy in glowing terms and, and, and kind of either sidesteps that term or avoids it in such way because he understands the, the risks of the re-territorialization of the powers of governmentality in the invocation of that term, whether it be through a parliamentary form of government or what have you. Do you mm-hmm. see... Mm-hmm. For example, well, first of all, maybe you can answer the question of whether or not you see this notion of anarchy coinciding with the concept of destituent power. And do you take that risk, uh, the risk that I've articulated, to be true in any sense? And maybe you could say something about how we should think about democracy in relation to these terms that I've brought in. So destituent power, for me, immediately resonates with uh, Agamben. Uh, there's a strong also concept of anarchy in Agamben linked with uh, this destituent uh, power, uh, or in French we say destitutive, it seems to me that there are two ways in contemporary philosophy of thinking about destituent power. One by Agamben and the other by Rancière. Even if Rancière doesn't uh, use this term, but still, I think there is something like uh, that kind of uh, topic in Rancière. Rancière would be more on the side of the democracy collective, a collective destituent power. And democracy uh, understood not as a regime or form of government, but as this uh, radical equality uh, I was mentioning a moment ago. And a kind of um, constitution of the, of the people out of its destitution in a certain sense. Constitution of the collective out of the destitution of uh, society in the classical sense. In Agamben, we have uh, the uh, opposite movement, which is uh, the famous problem of the form of life. So it's not about democracy. I don't think that Agamben ever really pronounces the term. It must be very seldom. Uh, so I don't think it is uh, his cup of tea. It's much more the form of life. That is how life has to incarnate, I think this is the word he uses, destituent power. And he reproaches Guy Debord to have mistaken the form of life, destituent form of life with private life. He says, I'm not talking about private life, but about um, the form of life. The form of life in the sense that it, in fact, creates, it's very Nietzschean, in fact, creates its own norms while living them. You know, it, it's, a, it's a process of self, um, almost plastic modality of uh, uh, creating norms. So this is what is desti- destituent for Agamben. It's not the absence of norms. It's not the absence of, of rules, even. but uh, the invention of rules, um, they are never decided in advance. And they're, they're always um, created in the moment. And it, it takes the model on uh, monastic communities, uh, religious communities, Franciscan mainly. So in other words, the, the normative dimension of the kind of anarchism that Agamben is agitating for is an actualization of norms in, in their performance, in their creation. Exactly. In the making, in the making. Great. Yeah. Norms in the making. Exactly. Yes. You know, this is the concept of excess habit in Aristotle. On those terms, 
I'm not prepared to to address this head on, but it seems that a a sort of notion of democracy as it circulates in in history might not be sufficient to capture the 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 sort of operation that that Agamben is valorizing here because nothing can 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 sort of uh land on or you know in, in, encapsulate the movement of, of this creative act and maybe mm-hmm. this is a good reason to avoid that term at least in terms of um yes. conceptualizing what freedom might be uh, but maybe what we'll do at this time is is kind of move on. I know that Adam had some questions about uh, your work on pleasure. Yes, because the term risk. Because I, mean, I have one question before that, but I can sort of fold them both into one. Because the first one is it's quite short. So, in the first in the first question is um, so what, why is anarchism the most plastic form of social organization in terms of you know the the call to you know the call to the call to give form to things the call to give form without command without that form itself becoming a new rk and uh, a new command and i guess the second one is um in a q a for a spike art magazine a while back you you said it's a uh, risky but pleasurable pleasurable because risky and you know because of my research is you know it's on sterner the central category for him is of, of mutual self-enjoyment or self, it's primarily self enjoyment but conducted within the context of, of a, an ethics of mutuality, how the practice of anarchism, the call to formation, the call to you know, form uh, this, this plastic form of social organization at the same time that one receives it, yeah, has this pleasurable element, this element of possibly even ecstasy of getting out of oneself from the, the fixity of one's own representations. Yes, absolutely. So why is it the most plastic uh, form of a political organization. This is exactly what I was, um, what we were talking about with Craig, I think, about Agamben, which is um, like norms in the making, like not obeying any kind of predetermined uh, rules or principles, once again, but um, plastically organizing one's own mode of living, collectively or individually. Because uh, in, in Rancière also, I mean, collectively, there's this dimension of plasticity. Uh, so anarchy, if, if it can function, can only function out of uh, plastic resources, plastic social resources of self-invention, self-regulation, auto-organization, about pleasure. It is true that there's a fundamental dimension of pleasure when you read some anarchists, like geographers mainly, Kropotkin, Reclus, you know, um, they enjoy it. I mean, this is... but. Uh, pleasure is a very, <laughs> here also, risky notion because um, pleasure is also death. And I think that on that point, we have to reread Freud because clearly in his book, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, he's clearly looking for a beyond principle that is an anarchy that goes beyond what people think pleasure is. That is just a little... Uh, quest for satisfaction. Freud says, no, 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 no. If there's a beyond the pleasure principle, it is because we're looking for a kind of pleasure that is anarchic, that that is uh, not obeying any kind of uh, law or, and as you know, in the end, it becomes also the death drive. So uh, yes, anarchism is pleasurable, but undoubtedly it deals also with death. And that's, that's the problem of anarchism, in fact, when you realize that, well, this is also what Hobbes says, if we were free from any form of uh, government, hmm, would we kill each other or would we try to find a way of uh, coexisting? Hmm? And I think this question will always remain open. And this is the limit of pleasure, because where is pleasure? Where is pleasure? Is it, is it in obeying a rule? Or is it in a exceeding? Yeah, this function of being liberated, an anarchic form of pleasure reminds me a little bit, although my Freud, my Freudian ease isn't, isn't too too good, and sort of being liberated from the compulsion to repeat, almost like a liberation from a addiction to, to principle itself, the repetition that that generically kind of engenders. And it makes me think of some of Freud's more um, recent, well, recent in Freud's time disciples, particularly some of the more libertarian communists, even the anarchist tendencies of someone like Wilhelm Reich. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Who tried, you know, to, to 
create a new version of pleasure. Uh, you know, he calls it orgiastic okay. potency, and it's the idea of a new biological site of a new kind of anarchic pleasure, which subverts this intermittent layer in which we find ourselves satisfying these very regimented, socially mandated, quite cruel kinds of desires. Yes, and I was, I was also thinking of sad, you know. I, I wonder with, with sad, like you get this idea in like later, uh, like individuals who are, are c clearly working towards the commune or at least would like to, to have their readers think that that's what's essentially going on. There, there is sort of this move uh, in text by like Tikkun to sort of engage directly with things that mutilate life, right? You get in the last chapter mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. this is not a program that there's this sort of pleasure mm -hmm. uh, that sits at the heart of engaging directly with these things that mutilate life. Again, like that goes back to Foucault too. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's it's just so strange to, to me that... Um, you know what again we have to ask these questions like are, are we to burn uh, to burn sod right um but uh there is sort of this this chance of once we've g been given uh an articulation of these things and how they they mutilate life right Deleuze says in his work on Foucault it's like Foucault's asking a newer version of the question what is to be done but he's doing it not in a, in a way that localizes power the way that that uh mm -hmm. the, the marxists and the maoists of his day did um but but i wonder like once once a, a, a theorist is able to identify this or that uh apparatus or technology or whatever one would like to call it and of course this will change you know the target will change uh in the 80s for all of these folks right like Foucault will will work towards the technologies of the self and this is a slight shift although I, I know that um you're you're giving a, a talk tomorrow pushing back against this notion that it's sort of a a libertarian oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. motion so I, I'm, I'm really excited for that um but I, I wonder you know once once uh we see in work these uh, identification of these things that mutilate life mm -hmm. Why is it that it's just left, okay, like, well, we, we have this entire array of tools in order to understand the fluidity and uh, the hypersensitivity of our domination and how it always changes in response to, like, whatever given resistance we provide. But why is it always just then left in suspension in, in again, as you state, like, this state of risk? Do you think that there, there may be uh, some sort of other problem that, these theorists that you have, you know, I think a pretty rightful frustration with that prevents them from taking that leaps that say like a Bakunin may? Well, in my, in my work, this is very weak, but I can't think of a better word. I think it's a uh, disavowal. I, I think there's something like a, a repression. There's something that prevents them from, yes, taking the lead and say, okay, uh, let's rethink seriously uh, what anarchism is what we can um, preserve from classical political anarchism, what we can take, uh, what we can benefit from current forms of anarchism, like uh, in Mexico, Zapatismo, in Kurdistan, and even in, uh, well, uh, Occupy movements, etc. And let's try, let, let's, for example, there are no serious readings of uh, Kropotkin, Proudhon, uh, you know, if we think of, uh, very, very good, very powerful reading of uh, anarchist text. There is none. Huh? Um, so yes, I think they cannot do it. I mean, th there's there's a form of um, yes, you're right, a fear. But but I don't understand why in Marxism, for example, uh, after all that happened in um, communist countries, hmm, uh, why don't they have the same fear? You know, why why is someone like Balibar today? Uh, you know, uh, so why is anarchism more risky? I don't know. I don't know. I think it is, a, yes, a, a, an internal repression, something. But, you know, I have an explanation for that. I mean, this is my explanation in my book. <laughs> it is what it is, really. But I think they stole the concept of anarchy. You know? They stole it. You know? Because when, when, when Sherman talks about anarchism, etc., etc., they did not, I mean, 
it's only Proudhon who transformed the term. Before Proudhon, anarchism was absolutely, well, was entirely a negative concept. Okay? It meant chaos, disorder, etc. It could not be used in a positive uh, way. And Proudhon has this magnificent text, which is what is property, in which he transforms, I mean, he, he accomplishes a semantic revolution by saying, Anarchism is not disorder, it's order minus power. From then on, anarchism could have, could get a positive meaning. And don't tell me that these people, Sherman, Deleuze, etc., can use the term anarchism without consciously or not knowing that the term had been transformed you know, by anarchists. So it's, there's a rapt here, there's a, a, a theft. Because where, where, where does Sherman take his concept of anarchy? It's not from Heidegger. Heidegger never uses the term. So he, he takes it from somewhere. I'm sure he's not aware of it. But necessarily, historically, if Proudhon hadn't existed, Sherman wouldn't have been able to talk about anarchism. right? Uh, because when Sherman talks about anarchism, it, it's never in the sense of disorder or chaos. It is in the Proudhonian sense. Okay? You might think this is totally crazy, but my opinion, my point of view is that philosophers don't jump, don't make the, the move toward anarchism because they hide, in a way or another, the theft of the concept. There's something here, you know, when you think how, how scrupulous they are uh, by doing etymologies, etc., by restituting the terms, or oh, this comes, you know, they never do the same with anarchism. Oh, sorry, I just want to say yes. Um, honestly, yes, I completely agree. I think that you can even see in a textual sense the extent to which various anarchisms have been repressed, particularly in the Marxist canon. I mean, for example, the 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 push from Sterner that that led Marx away from Feuerbach and, and humanism, the principle of humanism, was itself repressed in the bowels of the German ideology until, you know, until, until 1932, I believe. And even then, you see Stirner's, uh, the monikers that Marx used for Stirner coming up in, in Das Kapital, or Sancho Panza. There is this lingering, explosive potentiality in the things, the, the systems these, articul these thinkers are articulating, which really hasn't shown up. And even in some contemporary... Yeah, Hegelian stuff. I mean, I, I really love Top Gowan's book on Hegel, but in one chapter, he completely destroys the notion of legitimate authority mm -hmm. for an articulation of Hegel's critique of substance. And then the next chapter is about why resisting, why resisting all the state resistance is dialectically quite a bad idea. There's no support of insurrection there. And there's, it's almost like there's been, a, in the Foucauldian sense, a repressed knowledge of the mm -hmm, anarchic. Mm -hmm. Which itself, in the Foucauldian, in, again, in the Foucauldian sense, is, is ready for its own you know, new insurrection. Exactly. There's something like a depth that is not acknowledged. There's something like a, yes, what I call a, a theft. <laughs> but perhaps, <laughs> uh, at, at least this is how I see it. So many interesting ideas, so many interesting ideas uh, are coming from anarchists, are repeated in the philosophers that we like, huh? uh, but uh, they never account for uh, the origin of these ideas. They would they would never say, "Oh, this I found in Proudhon." This never. Why? I don't know. I I see a very strong thread connecting thinkers like Rancier and others not going far enough, basically affirming metaphysical anarchism, mm -hmm. not connecting with political anarchism, and I, I see there's a thread connected with your. Uh, the question that you raise about the the philosophy of pleasure, you don't want to philosophize pleasure in terms of a mere inversion, one that translates the experience of pleasure, the the actuality of pleasure into the the traditional concept of pleasure, the traditional way of doing philosophy. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. And I'm curious because it made me think of Nietzsche in the birth of tragedy, where he talks about Socrates and how maybe the enterprise of all philosophy of all thinking may be marred from the very start by a kind of resentment that takes pleasure out of its actuality in our attempt to philosophize it. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm curious if, if, if that's a concept that resonates with you. And, and, and if that's true, is there a way to think pleasure 
that that doesn't fall victim to what Nietzsche points out about Socrates in The Birth of Tragedy. Well, that's very interesting. And if you look at even Deleuze, um, when philosophers, even the most uh, deconstructive, when they talk about pleasure, you always find the idea of a self-government, that uh, pleasure cannot exist without a kind of self-governance, uh, a series of rules. You know, look at his uh, book on uh, masochism. Hmm? Um, it, it's always, and same thing in Foucault, uh, same thing in Derrida, etc. There's always a limit. Huh? Pleasure, in fact, in philosophy, in, in my view, has never been emancipated from the idea of government, except in Freud, in a very problematic way in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Otherwise, there's always a notion of government. This is what I'll try to, to demonstrate tomorrow, that what undermines Foucault's anarchism is this idea of, well, government is always re-entering the, the scene, always. Even if there's a critic of governmentality, even et cetera, et cetera, there's always this idea that pleasure can only be uh, reached or experienced through um, the couple passivity activity, which is another form, another way of uh, interpreting, obeying, and commanding uh, passivity activity. And this couple seems to be indestructible. So the question is, um, what if this couple, uh, activity pass passivity, was destroyed? What if uh, it disappeared? What then would become of pleasure? Hmm? Yeah, I, it, it seems to me that the ultimate risk here is, is that when pleasure links with a philosophical discourse, that the discourse will attempt to legislate over it. <laughs> Right. Um, and this, I think, is what what Nietzsche is alluding to anyway in The Birth of Tragedy. And maybe we can yes. find this in, in Deleuze as well. I mean, at that point is just um, is is our expression of pleasure in vocalized through inchoate screaming, <laughs> you know, like like how do we do that? I mean, it seems to me that we want to be able to articulate a concept of pleasure, but it needs to be done so in a way that it it is self-destructive or self-destituting in some way. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So I was I was thinking back to the um, the Sherman text, this idea of the closure of being, um, sort of the end of uh, metaphysics and systematicity and and, and so on. Um, and I suppose I was wondering for Nietzsche, at least on my reading of Nietzsche. There's, a, there's this worry about the modern age following the death of metaphysics in a certain way of, of a kind of nihilism. And in, in, in a book by mm -hmm. Bernard Reginster, he talks about this and he says one of, one of the kinds of nihilism that, that Nietzsche worries about is um, a kind of groundlessness, the, the lack of any, any principles uh, by which we can orient ourselves, how we act and yeah. relate to mm -hmm. each other in the world. Um, and presumably, uh, Sherman's conclusion is that this is uh, precisely the situation <laughs> um, that, that we have. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering, when it comes to, um, to, to praxis, to, to anarchism in, in particular, um, how, how should we think about um, uh, this, this lack of principles? Is, is it... Um, is there some way of um, orienting ourselves without them? Or, yeah, I, I don't know any, any better way to say this. How, how, do, how do we get by without um, uh, grounding of, for these principles or without principles at all? Yes, of course. Uh, this is the fundamental uh, critique of anarchism. Like, uh, we cannot live without principle. Uh, how can we live our lives uh, individually or collectively if we don't have any rules or... Okay. First of all, I mean, I insist on that because uh, the first thing to say is that um, anarchism is about, I would say, cancelling of the difference between commanding and obeying. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, cancelling of what they interpret as the very core of domination. For them, there, there cannot be any obedience that is not immediately transformable into domination. So to live without principle is, first of all, 
to um, avoid, if this is ever possible, but anyway, to avoid any form of uh, governmentality. That is the logic of obeying and commanding. You know that Aristotle in politics uh, says in the beginning that citizenship uh, relies on the princ- on, on the principle, sorry, that every citizen might should be uh, in turn commanding and obeying. But unfortunately, he changes his mind in in the middle of the book. But in fact, politics in the beginning, and this is what Rancière says, has a very strong anarchistic anarchist element. So living without principle is that. Now, uh, when it comes to rules, uh, it well, uh, anarchism relies on federalism, platforms, and consensus. So it is a, a mode of organization that relies on very short, as you said, mandat in French. Uh, you know, when someone has a responsibility, very short uh, functions, let's say, renewable, mainly administrative. Everything has to be discussed. Everything has to be collectively, you know, this is something like that, hmm? L- like it was in the commune. And now on a metaphysical ground, well, it's about uh, what we were talking about a moment ago, like the capacity of each of us to invent one's own rule. Uh, and this is also a very um, Nietzschean uh, idea. You remember what he says about selection. He says selection per se is not bad. It's not a bad thing. But most of the time, selection is made out of pre-existing principles. So the ones who are selected are in fact the most conform uh, uh, to the predetermined principles. A a, a genuine selection would be a selection that invents its own criteria as it goes. Mm? So this is how I see the absence of principle. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's plasticity. That is, uh, how you invent the rule that you need in the moments at the moment when you need it uh, in a very fluid way. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, I wanted to put it the, the question to you, and then you get a you know kind of the answer. I, I have to admit, I was somewhat look, um, looking for in a way. Um, it, it, val- it validates quite a bit of what I've been researching, but um, it's a great answer. Thank you. Catherine, I I just want to thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us here. This has been an excellent interview. No, it was great. I mean, thank you so much. It was very, very interesting for me. You've done a great service to the podcast community who would love to hear these ideas. So that's awesome. Maybe the last thing that I'll, I'll end with is I just wrote here in a very facetious way in my notebook, real anarchism has never been philosophized. True or false? Uh, True. (laughs) <laughs> True. Okay. Well, True. All right. Well, we well nice. we hope to hear more from you in the future, and we will definitely take a look at your work when it lands on our desk. <laughs> I hope it will one day. <laughs> yes. Wow! How amazing was that? We should all give thanks to Adam on the podcast here, who was able to recruit Catherine for this interview. Some upcoming events for Acid Horizon fans. We are going to do our Difference and Repetition reading group within the next two weeks or so. I will put out an announcement about that. We have upcoming episodes on Deleuze and Gattari's Faciality Plateau, as well as an episode on La Ruelle. Also, a big thank you to our patrons and other supporters elsewhere who have made this podcast possible. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we will see you next time.